knew what war was like. I had seen death, too much of it. And also I did know that flying, it would soon be over if you'd come to the end of your life. You didn't have to sleep in mud night after night, day after day. But I think the main reason was that I very much wanted to fly. Our training was pretty sketchy, because after all, at that period, everything, including flying, was frightfully experimental and tentative. There, for the first time, I really saw an airplane close to, handled it, touched it, and all that sort of thing. We had uh, a proper dual control machine which had the complete controls in the pupil's seat and uh, during the course of instruction one had a certain amount of instruction in the uh, dual control machine and a certain amount of instruction in the non-dual control machine. There was a, a, a fitter and a rigger on each aircraft who worked on that aircraft alone and, and then we used to go down to the workshops and uh, be trained in rigging and sail making and the, those who were, who were for engines used to go to the engine shops and had uh, training on the engines. The formula for starting up an aircraft was very precise. The, you got the uh, officer in the cockpit and when he was ready you would say to him, petrol on, switch off, suck in. Well, then you'd turn the, the propeller a few times so as to get a charge into the cylinders of the engine and you would say to him, contact, sir. He would answer, contact, and he would switch the, the thing uh, into contact. And then you'd hold it with two hands and give it a tremendous swing. And if it fired, that was all right. You needed to start to run and you'd get clear of it and stand by the chops. When he waved his hand, you would pull the chops away and you was, knew that he was ready to take off. The engine failure taking off was one of the great causes of casualties. Uh, people tended to try and turn back and didn't put their noses far enough down to get a gliding angle and side slipped or spun and crashed into the ground. I can remember every minute of that flight. It took off the engine, sort of struggling to get up into the air, and then the pilot throttled back a little and flattened out, and how it went smoothly. And then when he he took a turn, a sharp turn, and I could see the ground, and I looked up vertically, and I could see the sky. And then we went round, and it seemed as though across the nose of the plane that the world was whizzing round until he flattened out and went straight again. I don't know why, it was a terrific thrill to me, this, the feeling of the plane being flown around. Eventually I did my first solo, which was a terrifying experience and only after struggling that left me alone in the machine did I realise that I knew nothing at all about it and I didn't even know what the controls did. As I was gliding in over the AID sheds onto the aerodrome, I found that I was undershooting. In other words, I was going to hit one of the hangars instead of getting over them. So in my panic, I did what I shouldn't have done. I jammed open the throttle suddenly, but the Lord being on my side, the engine picked up, and I bounced up over that shed. I landed, the undercarriage collapsed, and down I went. It was a, a bad show to have crashed an aircraft. Major Higgins came running across and he said uh, something like, if you want to kill yourself, you can, but don't kill one of my men. I bought from the local pack of Harriers in Sussex four couple of hounds. These I took out with me to France. Uh, I hunted hare with a most distinguished field beautifully mounted on their first charges. I was told I'd be posted to uh, number five squadron 
and a tender was being sent out for me to take me up there. As we drove on and on, more east, I wondered whether we were going through the lines. But uh, France was a bigger country than I imagined, and um, eventually we arrived. The duties of the squadron were artillery observation, which was the A and C flight, and uh, offensive patrols, which was the Vickers fighter. We had no distinguishing marks on our aircraft. Now the Germans hit on a very good uh, plan for marking theirs. They had a big black cross on a white ground, and we had nothing. So our infantry and other soldiers, if there was an aircraft came too low over their f trenches, they'd fire at it, whether it was British or German. They did a lot of dummies that way, and something had to be done about it. And then we tried to decide on some kind of a mark for our own. Well, the first thing was to put a Union Jack on. They painted Union Jacks on the underneath of the plane and flew up with it, and that just looked like a smudge. And then we painted the, the target, as we used to call it, what they call the roundel now. And the aircraft was sent up, and the staff officers decided that was a good thing. But while that was going on, we actually sent some men from the Royal Flying Corps into the trenches. And if an aircraft came over, that man would tell the commander of the platoon whether it was German or English. <laughs> 